Happy to be joining you today. I am going to give you a bit of an overview on um, who we are and what, what we're um, aiming to do. And then Chris is going to get into more detail about um, our work to date and where we're headed. So I wanted to start just by taking a step back in terms of what, what is the purpose of science-based targets and, and what's the, um, the mission of science-based targets network. We are working to enable companies and cities to align their efforts with science. And the purpose in doing so is to ensure that they're doing their part, or another way of saying that is they're doing enough for an equitable net zero and nature positive future. So that's our mission. Uh, we will focus today primarily on company content, um, but we do have as a target actor group cities as well. So when I say we, who, who are we? Um, we are a network, we are not an organization um, comprised of over 45 organizations. And um, as of yesterday, I'm excited to share that UNEP-FI is one of them. So they'll be added to this page. Um, over 45 organizations that are environmental NGOs, mission-driven mission organizations who all see the need to co-create consensus guidance for companies and cities on what it means for them to do their part, to stop nature loss, to address climate change, to ensure an equitable future. This is the same group of four companies that are part of, that formed the Science-Based Targets Initiative. If you're familiar with um, the methodology and tools for companies to set climate science-based targets. Those same four organizations, plus many more because of the broader scope, have come together under the banner of Science-Based Targets Network to expand the scope on science-based targets to include nature. The purpose is because we recognize that um, the times of addressing isolated issues are behind us. And together, we need to discover integrated solutions um, across not only halting climate change, but also stopping nature loss. And because of the um, multiple drivers of nature loss, that's talking about um, addressing our freshwater resources, biodiversity, land use, and our oceans. And so that is the full scope. When we refer to science-based targets for nature, um, that's the scope we're talking about. And with that, I'd like to hand it, oh, I have one more before that. Um, so I was interested to see in December, I'm not sure um, how many of you might have seen it, that there was a resolution from the EU Parliament specifically calling for corporate sustainability strategies to include science-based targets and transition plans that are aligned not only with the Paris Agreement, but also with the CBD, and with international agreements addressing deforestation. And so, um, and Gemma pointed to um, multiple initiatives right now that are looking at, at that broader scope. And so um, we hope that this is really timely and that um, we, can, we can share with you where we're at so that you can join us on the journey to, um, to build out the full methodology. And with that, um, Chris is going to give you an overview of what guidance we have to date and where we're headed. Thanks, Aaron. So I'm, I'm going to give a very, very quick uh, introduction to uh, kind of where we're at in terms of developing the target setting framework uh, for science-based targets for nature. You can find uh, all of this content and a whole lot more uh, in the document kind of high, uh, shown here called our initial guidance for business. This was released in September of last year. Uh, it's, it's still very much a consultation uh, draft and it's kind of the, the thinking is being updated over time. Um, but definitely, you know, if you're interested in, in thinking, in reading more, I would suggest uh, uh, going here as your, as your first stop. So one of, the, one of the key things we did in this document, we did a lot of things in this document, but one of the key things we did is actually put out a generalized definition of, of what science-based targets are. Um, yeah, this it definition already existed for climate change specifically within the context of the Science-Based Targets Initiative, like Aaron uh, mentioned. Uh, but a more generalized definition actually wasn't uh, wasn't available at the time. So we spent uh, put on our thinking hats and spent a lot of time kind of hammering out 
what what do we actually mean when we say science-based targets? And this is the definition we came up with. Just so uh, everyone's on the same page. The, for the There are two big parts of this definition. Basically, science-based targets are targets, and they are, of course, science-based versions of targets. So what exactly does that mean in each one of these cases? The fact that they're targets means that they are measurable, actionable, time-bound objectives that are, uh, you know, basically actors, companies, cities, financial institutions must be able to kind of do measure some value, take uh, a baseline value, take some actions that will change the value and track progress uh, of that value. Uh, that's, of course, just what a target means. To me, it's science-based, means that uh, it's the ambition of this target is aligned with Earth's limits and societal sustainability goals. And that, that's kind of a mouthful, but we uh, we specifically kind of made this broad, uh, recognizing that the scope of science-based targets, we wanted to kind of reflect uh, all of the various, uh, various kind of thresholds, limits, and goals associated with uh, environmental objectives that, that we know of. And on the next slide, I'll kind of show, you know, what is this at that scope that we're talking about? Uh, on the left, you see this uh, a figure probably some of you or many of you are, are familiar with called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. This is kind of one of the leading frameworks talking about what does it mean to be a safe operating space or you know the limits to how what how humans can impact the environment while still maintaining kind of a, like safe levels of the ecosystem services that we all depend on um that's on the one side is this earth's limits idea but also we wanted to make sure that what we're doing is aligned with kind of broader societal goals for environment within the context of overall sustainability so we're also looking at how these targets can align with contributions that businesses and cities are making to what are called the Rio conventions, the big UN frameworks that set up kind of what our environmental objectives are for the planet. Uh, this includes the Convention on Biological Diversity or CBD, the Convention to Combat Desertification, CCD, uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, and of course the SDGs, uh, the, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So it's important to, to include both of these co uh, concepts for, for multiple reasons, most notably that kind of, uh, that the balance of these ideas of safety and justice, we wanna make sure that our targets are both uh, aligning with broader sustainability, but also staying within the safe operating space. Uh, and the more importantly, or well, equally importantly, uh, we want to make sure that they have, a, a, like, again, that broad scope that covers all of biodiversity and nature, but also the ecosystem services that humanity depends on. What's the conceptual framework behind these targets? Uh, if you're broadly familiar with uh, the, the IPBES, which uh, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, they put out probably the most influential scientific report on nature and biodiversity of the past 20 years, uh, last last year, well, two years ago now, um, called the Global Assessment. And they've laid out this framework of kind of how do we think about nature? Uh, the key things to note, there's three levels of this framework, drivers, pressures, and states. We all kind of know that the state of nature in terms of its ecosystems, its species, and what are called nature's contributions to people or ecosystem services have all been in decline over the last 20 years. And that is the, the result of these five key pressures that were highlighted by IPBES. Land, water, and sea use change, over-exploitation of uh, natural resources, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. Uh, behind those pressures are then the kind of key underlying drivers of economic growth, demographics, sociocultural changes, institutions and governance and so on. So we, we kind of take this overarching framework of the pressures and states of nature as, our, as the kind of inspiration for the targets that we're, that we're developing. Um, and I should note, this is also very similar to uh, kind of the framing taken in the very excellent recent PRI uh, document on primer on biodiversity. So we take the, that kind of framework and uh, kind of lay out what are the types of targets that we might want to see companies and, uh, and cities take if they want to be contributing to a better state of nature. Uh, there's, we have the drivers themselves. Those are very high level, so they're kind of harder to measure and harder to uh, you know, think about contributing to. But we know there's these five key pressures that exist across land, 
freshwater systems and oceans uh, that I listed on the last slide. We know we need to reduce all of those pressures very uh, dramatically in order to halt the decline of nature. But we also need to be tracking the, the state of nature itself uh, in terms of, again, its species, its ecosystems, and the ecosystem services. So collectively, you can kind of think of these eight categories, the five pressures and the three states as the overall kind of scope that we might think of in terms of uh, what, how do we measure nature uh, and how do we set targets on it? We also laid out uh, kind of a stepwise process for how, uh, how companies and cities should think about uh, going to set science-based targets for nature. Some of this is pretty obvious. Uh, obviously to, you know, to set a target, you have to, again, measure something and then measure it over time as you're trying to, uh, to protect it. Uh, to meet the target, rather. But uh, we also noted that there's kind of some pre-steps to measurement, and there's also kind of some post-steps to measurement. So we laid out this five-step process, the first being assess, where uh, a, the company or city is going to kind of look at its key material issues. It should be very familiar to anybody who's familiar with, uh, you know, corporate or sustainability or sustainable investment. Trying to do an overall materiality assessment What's maybe slightly new for, for nature is that it is really important that this is done as much as possible spatially dependent or you know, place-based because all almost unlike climate change, uh, almost all of the key pressures on nature are very spatial. Uh, using water, for instance, in one place is very different than using water in another place in terms of its impact. Uh, in step two, uh, basically, the actor then takes the outcome of that assessment, uh, or you can think about that as a natural capital assessment, and then figures out where am I going to focus, uh, which issues, and where in this, where on the planet do I want to kind of focus my efforts. Then there's the measurement step, where you'll be measuring a key indicator, developing a monitoring plan, setting targets, uh, and disclosing those targets publicly. And then, of course, comes my favorite step, which is taking action. We want to make sure that uh, the companies are, uh, the whole purpose of this is not just to measure things, but is to uh, take action for nature. And we set up the actions based on kind of the well-known uh, mitigation uh, hierarchy or conservation hierarchy. Avoid first, reduce second, restore and regenerate nature third after you've done as much reduction as possible. And also we added a, a key element uh, called transform because we noted that uh, what the science tells us is that we don't just need kind of like single actions in single places, but we also need general system transformation uh, and that we want to make sure that companies and cities are contributing to that broader system transformation as well. Finally, of course, we're going to be monitoring uh, progress towards the target, reporting that progress publicly uh, with some level of verification. I want to highlight just quickly, those are the, high, the very high level introduction to what is in the, 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 the um, document. There's a lot more content we can get into, but I wanted to highlight kind of two more key things of kind of where we expect companies uh, and cities can get started today. I think Aaron mentioned we're in about halfway through an initial three year sprint to define science-based targets for nature and set up these measurement frameworks. We're doing a lot of things all at once. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the measurement issues in more detail in the discussion. But one of the things that we're hoping uh, companies uh, in particular can do already is kind of do this value chain impacts and dependencies assessment or you know, a natural capital assessment of their global value chain. Try and find of those kind of five key pre pressures or impacts, where are they having those pressures? Uh, what, like how severe are they? And that will kind of set up the, the, the focus areas that they can set targets on once the, targets, uh, be, once the target setting becomes available. And this is important to highlight because this is something that companies can get started on today. And it's also something that I think financial institutions can get started on today in terms of understanding the key impacts and dependencies on nature. The other thing that we put uh, in the document that is uh, important, I think, to note in this context is that there are some targets that we feel are sufficiently developed and sufficiently kind of aligned with, uh, you know, with limits and goals that we can actually say these targets can be set today. Um, in particular, there's four that we highlighted in, in the document, uh, one on deforestation and conversion. I know from a financial standpoint, it's been a lot of efforts over the last couple of years on deforestation free uh, portfolios. That's a key, uh, key financial application here of that target. Uh, second, on uh, resource exploitation of water, 
Uh, there's already methods available for companies to kind of measure their impacts on water use uh, in various basins and try and reduce that impact. Climate change, I think everybody's broadly familiar with uh, science-based targets for climate. And, and finally, kind of ecosystems, uh, ecological integrity for at least agricultural land, we think is well enough developed that uh, we know we want to see kind of contiguous, uh, contiguous ecological areas within uh, agricultural land and uh, this base, based on a lot of emerging science on the importance of regenerative agricultural practices. So finally, uh, before we, we turn, um, I think it was, it was important, I was talking almost exclusively about this guidance for companies. Um, it's important to note kind of how we see financial institutions playing a role uh, both today and, uh, and tomorrow. So we put one of the other key ideas we put in this document is this, uh, and we're, we did not invent this uh, concept by any means, is this idea of creating climate and nature ambition loops, where kind of voluntary action by what are called non-state actors, companies and cities, can kind of amplify new policy, and new policy then drives better, uh, further action uh, in the real economy. Um, and crucially, because of kind of the intersection between climate and nature, these two ambition loops can work together if we identify the right types of actions that companies and cities uh, should be taking. Now, financial institutions are a really important part of this broader ecosystem, both in terms of being target setters themselves, but also in terms of driving your investees to set science-based targets uh, that, are, that are aligned with, with our global goals. So today, what we think uh, kind of what FIs can get started on, first, I think, uh, you know, important to kind of understand your own impacts and dependencies on nature kind of at a high portfolio level. It's a great tool out there if you're not aware of it called Encore that was partly developed by UNFFI. Uh, secondly, you can join our corporate engagement program to start engaging with companies and with the, the, the institutions that are developing these frameworks because we are you know, in very real time thinking through the measurement, uh, measurement frameworks and target setting protocols for companies. And third, you can start already engaging with your investees to, to get started get them to you know, do, do their own impacts and dependencies assessment and start thinking through uh, you know, what kind of targets they should be setting for nature. By 2022, when we hope all of, uh, all of these methodologies will be fully available, uh, we again you know, think you'll be able to engage with your investees to get them to set science-based targets for nature and potentially, and I stress potentially, um, we're, we're, we may have uh, methods available for setting science-based targets for nature at portfolio level. This is somewhat funding, uh, funding dependent, but uh, it's definitely on our priority list. So uh, I will stop there uh, and turn it back to Gemma. Thank you so much.